For the last three weeks, or two weeks, we have been speaking concerning the Sermon on the Mount. The Lord had a lot to say about human nature and also concerning our relationship with Him and with God. I'd like for you to turn to Matthew, the seventh chapter. Matthew, the seventh chapter. We're going to continue the, with some of the things that he said as he spoke to his followers there on the mount. The Lord was very much concerned about the heart of man. Now, when the Bible speaks about the heart of man, it does not necessarily refer to that heart that beats and pumps our blood within us, but it's referred to the inner man. The inner man. You remember the verse, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh? Well, it's not the heart that pumps, but it's the from within. That which we th is a part of our nature, in other words, that comes out through the mouth. And so the Lord was very much concerned about the heart. <clears throat> and these two verses or a few verses has reference to the sincerity, the real sincerity of the relationship that we have with God. Matthew 7, begin with verse 7. He said, Ask, and shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Now, as we read these two verses, it just seems that there's no doubt. But whatever we ask, we're going to receive. Because it says, ask, and it shall be given you. Nothing attached to it, seemingly. But yet, you have experience, and so have I. We Many times we've asked God for various things, and he seen fit not to grant it. <clears throat> so we have to conclude then that it is up to him as we ask. But nevertheless, as you read these two verses, you can feel that it also depends upon our sincerity. So many times, Seemingly man sees and feels no need of God until he's in need. When things go wrong and he's not able to cope with it, then he calls out to God, God help me. I do not feel that that's what the Lord is referring to, but he's bringing, him out, bringing out that we need to be sincere when we come to him. As you do not necessarily have to turn to it, but in Acts 19 verse 15, there, there is an evil spirit there that, uh, uh, well, getting, going back and relating to you, there were some individuals that decided that they wanted to call upon God and perform some miracles. But apparently they did not feel a need of God prior to that. And so when they call, cried out for help to perform these miracles, the evil spirit says, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Who are you? I've never heard you cry out to God before. In other words, yes, Satan is standing by and he's listening to our prayers and our desires and so forth. And so here, 
Excuse me. In that verse, the evil one is standing by and he's never heard their voices before to cry out to God. Brethren, we shouldn't wait until we have a need to cry out to God, to thank Him, to praise Him. But it should be something that we do every day. <laughs> every day. <clears throat> In our prayers, have you ever tried to pray for, let's say, five minutes? and not ask God for something. Just praise Him and express your feelings to Him only for five minutes. Try it sometime. And I don't think you'll find it very easily done. Because we're so used after praising Him for a few moments and we start asking for various things. Asking is fine, and God wants us to come and ask Him. He wants us to realize our dependency upon Him. But that should not be the focal point in our prayers. Our focal point should be praise and adoration. As we read the book of Revelation, it very clearly speaks about the angels of heaven praising and adoring God. And we too, when we come to him, he sh should be able to recognize our voice right away because he's been used to our communicating with him. Notice the 11th verse here in, in Matthew 7. <clears throat> prior to a few verses prior to this, it describes how anxious God is to give us what we ask. And Jesus said, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, and don't we know how to give good gifts to our children? We do it because we want to. And we know that our children will be appreciative of what we do for them. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to, to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father, which is in heaven, give you good things to them that ask him? Yes, God is very pleased when we come and when we ask him for things of which we cannot provide for ourselves. There is absolutely nothing, brethren, that we can do of our own selves. We may feel that our raiment and our food and our shelter is something of which we have provided for ourselves. That's not so. Every good and perfect gift comes down from above comes down from above. God is the one that has given it to us. The scriptures are very clear. There's nothing we can do for ourselves or of ourselves. But it is God that has allowed us to. So therefore, sincerity is very important in our devotion and our relationship with him. In the sixth chapter, in the sixth chapter, verses 25 and 26, we find the feeling comes through here referring to our dependence upon God. Our dependence. Beginning with verse 25, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, for what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? <clears throat> the word is describing, and wants us to realize, as I mentioned before, our dependency, total, absolute dependency upon God. 
For the next verse says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. And Christ reminds us here, he says, Are you not much better than they? But I've seen so many, or well, maybe that's overemphasizing. I'll use the word too many. Too many times have I seen in my ministry various ones that fall upon hard times. There's nothing wrong in that. My wife and I have seen hard times. But the point is, they, they feel that God is not going to provide for them, and so they go against the Lord's will and work on Sabbath as he's commanded us not to do. Jesus is reminding here if he takes care of the birds, who doesn't sow? They don't reap, but he takes care of them. He wants to remind us we are better than the birds, and if he provides for them, he will also provide for us. We are totally dependent upon him. And he wants us to understand that. And he wants us to have the faith to believe that he will take care of us. Coming back to the 19th verse, he's reminding us that it's natural for us to, how should I describe it? To, well, maybe the thought will come to me that I can describe it after I read the verse. It says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Now that doesn't sound, uh, how should I say? Uh, in other words, we could take it the Lord is telling us, don't do anything about the future. You get the paycheck, spend it all. But that's not what he is saying. He says, lay not for yourselves treasures upon earth. <clears throat> he says, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. He is telling us not to put our trust in that. When it comes preparing for the future, even God says, go to the ant. Now that's somewhat degrading, you could say. I'm a human being, I'm a man, I can think, go to the ant and learn from him. That's what God says. Go to the ant and learn from it. The ant has no leaders. But yet they work together and they prepare for the future. So they'll never so there'll never be a time when they will be without. So God is not telling us to spend every penny as soon as we get it. But not to put our trust in that. Not to put our trust in that. He says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doeth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. It's something that no one can take from us. The things we do for the Lord, in other words. Yet, the bank account, in other words, <laughs> is in heaven. <clears throat> in other words, in the mind of the Lord, he remembers our deeds. He remembers our works. 
And if someone tells you that works has nothing to do with our salvation, remember the works, the words of of uh, uh, James it says, "By works are we sanctified." No, we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. As I've told you before, grace done, doesn't give us the prerogative of living whatever way we want to live. And so works comes in after salvation for the Lord. But he's telling us here not to depend upon the things of this world. We know <laughs> The human nature is such a, boy, if I get a good job, that people look at me as I've accomplished something. If I could become president of the, of the company, boy, that'll be something. Well, if the Lord should allow you to do that, then fine. Praise him for that. But don't think that we've done it of our own selves. Where your treasure is, there's where your heart is going to be. You're going to put yourself all into it because that's what you're interested in. That's what you desire. And the Lord is telling us to put our trust and our faith in our Creator and in our God. That is how we build up treasures in heaven is what we do upon this earth in the judgment day the Lord is going to remember our righteous works unto him in the 33rd verse it says but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you priorities there's one thing, brethren, we have to get in order. That is our priorities. What's the most important thing in life? We have to decide that. We have to decide what's important to us, not only now, but in the future. And he's telling us here to prioritize but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you take therefore no thought for tomorrow for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof we have to live more than just for today. There's a future that we need to be concerned about. Have we made plans for the future? I'm reminded of a story that I read one time. I don't know, can't remember from what I read. It's been so long ago that it actually happened or someone just simply used it as a <clears throat> teaching thought. The, father, uh, uh, the young man was talking to his grandfather. And the grandfather says, and he called him by name. What is your plans? Well, Grandpa, I want to get an education. I want to go on to high school. All right, that's fine. What after that? Well, Grandpa, I want to go to college. Get a better education. That's fine, son. What about after that? Well, Grandpa... I want to get married, have a family. That's fine. What about after that? Well, Grandpa, I never thought beyond that. <clears throat> 
We have to think for the future. Prepare for the future as well as today. I've made the comment so many times as a funeral. We need to prepare to die as well as to live. We need to prepare to die as well as to live. And that's what Christ is talking about here. We need to prioritize, get our priorities in order. <clears throat> there is different kinds of devotion, but it seems to me that Christ in the Sermon on the Mount speaks about active devotion. In the sixth chapter, verses five and six, he says, when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. They want to be seen as if, and they would speak, I'm sure, flowery words, <clears throat> There's been a time or two in my ministry that I've encountered individuals that just didn't want to pray publicly. They thought that that was bringing undue attention to them. And I had to explain that in their praying, they're not necessarily speaking for themselves, but they're speaking for the congregation also. And they're speaking in behalf of the congregation. They were able to understand then. But also others I have encountered they said, Brother Walker, I don't want to pray publicly because I, uh, my words are just not educational. I, I want to tell you, brethren, it's not on how we pray the words necessarily has to be flowery, but words that come from the heart as lowly as they could be, they're still precious in God's sight. I marvel that the one who inspired the Bible for us today has all the wisdom that there, there is in the whole world, but yet he uses words that you and I can understand. He doesn't use those big, long words. Well, there's some short words, too. I don't know what the meaning of them are. He uses words that the average man can understand. And he uses the individual that's not full of himself, but he's full of God, full of the Spirit. And so prayer is important. As we pray, it's not the education that we have. It's not how we can pray that necessarily pleases or gives impression to God, but it's that's what comes from the heart, from the inside. God or Christ was also in the, in the Sermon on the Mount was concerned about our attitude toward man. In the fifth chapter, beginning with the 17th verse, <clears throat> Matthew five seventeen, Christ says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. I was doing some house-to-house -house work one time, 
And I came across, as I knocked on the door, and the man came to the, to the door. We got to discussing. Excuse me. The law of God. Because he asked me what church I was from. And so immediately he wanted to explain that I was keeping the wrong day. And he quoted this verse here. <clears throat> I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. He tried to explain the word fulfill here means to do away. If that's the case in Christ. As, I was going to say it doesn't sound too good. In other words, he would be speaking out both sides of his mouth. First of all, he definitely says, I came not to destroy. So how can then fulfill refers to destroying or doing away with it? Fulfill here means to live up to it. To do all that God's commands ask of man to do. Christ is our example. And he came to live it. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. And he says, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Seems to me like works is important. But again, I reiter reiterate, no, we're not saved by works. But after salvation has come unto us, after we have received it, then we want to live for the Lord in the way that pleases him. In verse 21 of the same chapter, he says, You have heard that it was said by them of old times, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Rika shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. God is very clear in our relationship with man. <clears throat> I marvel and this is, I'm not speaking against the women, <laughs> because I know you're going to agree with me when I finish. But some people sound as if you're against them. They say they should have control of their own bodies. We should be able to do with our bodies whatever we want. And that's how the abortion law came to came in effect. They feel that it is their right to do with their body whatever they want. But the question comes to the forefront, where's the right of that child to live? That child has a right to live. And so, just as God tells us here, not to kill or to take a life, that is nothing but murder, brethren. It's nothing but murder. Taking a life. Someone has to protect that individual until he's able to make decisions on his own. And God has provided the parents to do that not to take its life. <clears throat> Christ was also concerned. Actions comes into the forefront. 
In verse 38, he says, You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I marvel as I watch television from time and various programs, and once in a while even in life, there's two verses that seems that they always can remember. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. They know, may not know much about the Bible, but they sure know about that one verse. But when we get to the New Testament, we find that the added law was abolished. And that tooth for a tooth, an eye for an eye, is no longer. And so he's telling us here in verse 38, he says, you have heard, you understand, it's been taught you. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek Turn to him the other also. Don't be so quick to retaliate. <clears throat> we are to respect those who believe differently than we do. And he says, Whatsoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him two miles, twain. Don't feel that we have our rights. Yes, we do have our rights. And not for a minute do I believe that Christ ever intended us to be a doormat for people to rub their mud off on. But on the other hand, let us be careful how we stand up to be counted. Let's make sure that we've gone the extra mile. <clears throat> he says, give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. If someone is in need, even though they have mistreated us, said something, done something, of which we wish they hadn't have. But yet when the time comes when they are in need, don't turn our backs on them. But we are to, to be free and liberal with our help. <clears throat> in the same chapter in, in verse 43, it speaks of another kind of love. You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That's going against human nature. That's not natural. But with Christ in us, we can control that human feeling. You treated me wrong. You spoke disrespectful of me sometime or other. That's human feelings. And I'm preaching to myself as much as anyone else present this morning. These words are for all of us. For all of us. He says that you may be the children of your father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Yes, in this life 
God blesses even the unjust. But there's a time coming in which and when we stand in the day of judgment, we will have something going our way which they won't. There's two classes of people when Christ comes. One class will cry for the rocks and the hills to hide them because they know that they, and apparently when Jesus comes, that thought, I get that impression, could be wrong, but I get the impression we will know whether we're ready or not. We will know within us whether we made the preparation. Because there be those who will cry for the rocks and the hills, hide them from the one that cometh. And the other class will say, this is my God, I have waited for him, and he will save me. Brethren, may we be in that class. May we be in that number that's waiting, longing, and anxiously longing for our Lord to come back. My closing text is in the 6th chapter and the 24th verse. 6th chapter and the 24th verse. It says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will despise, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. We cannot have two masters, only one. And I thought that would be a good final thought to close with as today is the third and the last sermon that I plan on speaking on the Sermon on the Mount, that is, at this, for this time. But may we have only one master and serve him with a thankful and a grateful heart. God bless, is my prayer.